Would you remain standing and pray with me the prayer of illumination? Draw us close, Holy Spirit, as the scriptures are read and the word is proclaimed. Let the word of faith be on our lips and in our hearts, and let all other words slip away. May there be one voice we hear today, the voice of truth and grace. Amen. You may be seated. Our scripture reading this morning is from Ephesians chapter 1, verses 15 through 23. Here is God speaks to us. For this reason, ever since I heard about your faith in the Lord Jesus and your love for all the saints, I have not stopped giving thanks for you, remembering you in my prayers. I keep asking that the God of our Lord Jesus Christ, the glorious Father, may give you the spirit of wisdom and revelation so that you may know him better. I pray also that the eyes of your heart may be enlightened in order that you may know the hope to which he has called you, the riches of his glorious inheritance in the saints and his incomparable incomparably great power for us who believe. That power is like the working of his mighty strength, which he exerted in Christ when he raised him from the dead and seated him at his right hand in the heavenly realms, far above all rule and authority, power and dominion, and every title that can be given, not only in the present age, but also in the one to come. And God placed all things under his feet and appointed him to be head over everything for the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills everything in every way. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, as we worship you this day, we ask that the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. We've been talking about Jesus Christ for the last two Sundays about how Jesus is fully human, fully divine, Son of God. I've asked both you and I to consider who do you say Jesus is? And we know that the answer has long-reaching implications. This passage from Ephesians emphasizes Christ's exclusive supremacy. Jesus is not one Lord among many, but is far above all rule and authority and power and dimension and every name that is named not only in this age, but in the age to come. And Christians throughout the centuries have proclaimed Christ's Lordship as central to their faith. Jesus came to teach us about love and compassion and justice, and fellowship, and integrity. I could go on and on. He died a horrid death on a cross to save us from our sins, and he rose again to give us hope for eternal life. You know, I think the greatest expression of God's devotion to humanity is the raising of Christ from
from the dead. And as our scripture says, all things have been placed already under Christ's feet, and he sits already at the right hand of God. <clears throat> and we, who are followers of Christ, are connected to the one who stands above all worldly powers because the church, the church is the body of Christ. <clears throat> Christ is raised by God's power from the dead. Christ is exalted to the right hand of God. Christ is above all rule and authority and power. All human powers, all angelic and demonic powers, all systems of power or dominion, not only in this age, but in the age to come. All are subject to Christ as sovereign with God. The epitome of this power is that Christ is the head of the church. His body is the new humanity created through him. For Irenaeus, who was the Bishop of Lyon in the second century, one of the early church fathers, Christ is the head or Lord because he is truly human. He is the second Adam whose life restored humanity to its original intention. Irenaeus wrote, he was incarnate and made man. And then he summed up in himself the long line of the human race, procuring for us a comprehensive salvation that we might recover in Jesus Christ what we lost in Adam. <clears throat> As Lord, the merciful lover of the human race, Christ gathers, restores, completes, fulfills, and perfects all things in his own humanity. What image do you have of Christ? I would wager that the image of Jesus as king would not be the first one that we think of. When we think of king, what image do you have? What does the word king conjure up for you? I think here's a few images from childhood, and I was blessed to have kids in the, in the gathering, and they all agreed with me, so what I came up with obviously is good, and these kids can tell me if I'm right. There's the fairy tale kings who are benevolent and often dead. Of course, there's always a wicked queen. And then king of the hill and king me in checkers. And then for us adults, there is the king, Elvis Presley. <laughs> Enough said? Yeah. King of the road, a chess king. And then last but not least, King George of England, who acted so awfully that the colonists rebelled. And I believe that's the reason we, nearly 300 years later, we have so much trouble with the concept 
of King. So what about you? What do you think of when you think of the word king or kingdom? Do you have trouble with the image of Jesus as king? The simple fact is a lot of folks have difficulty with the concept Jesus as a king and difficulty with that whole idea of the kingdom of God. It's not something we can easily relate to or appreciate no matter how often we read the words that Jesus uttered to Pilate, my kingdom is not of this world. And when we do declare that Jesus is king, when we declare that he is our Messiah, the chosen one of God, we have a hard time wrapping our minds around what it is we are truly confessing. I think the problem here may be that we know that kings are people who issue commands to others who are supposed to obey. They are the people that their subjects are supposed to be loyal to and whom they're supposed to serve, no matter how they feel about it. And we, in this age, perhaps more than any other age in history, we don't like that. We don't like the idea of obedience. We don't like the idea that someone can command us to do something, that someone has authority over us. But God has given us the free will to be able to choose. And if we choose God in Jesus Christ has given us a job, a mission, and that is to make disciples of Jesus Christ. And we Methodists like to say, make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. If we are God's people, if Jesus is indeed the Lord of our lives, then our mission is to make disciples. And we begin that by growing our own faith, our own spiritual maturity by the means of grace, daily prayer, daily scripture reading, attending corporate worship, and partaking of Holy Communion. When we imagine Jesus as our friend, as our shepherd, as our brother, as the one who comes to us as a healer and a teacher, then we accentuate the love and the grace and the goodness that he had and still has. But it makes Jesus user-friendly. It makes Jesus first among equals. And sometimes we just get too comfortable with our images of Jesus. 
We often resist too much the full consequences of calling him king, king of kings and lord of lords. If Jesus Christ is the Lord of my life, then my job, my mission, is to grow myself into a mature Christian, and my job is to go out and make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world. And folks, that's scary. We sometimes resist too much the implications of naming him as the book of Revelation does, the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end, the ruler of all kings on earth, the one who is and who was and who is to come. Does our image of Jesus as king extend to making him Lord over everything in our lives? We've been talking about making Jesus first in our lives. And that's our job. That's our mission. Because you see, if Jesus wasn't King of Kings and Lord of Lords, he couldn't also be our Savior. Because Jesus, fully human and fully divine, died for our sins because he was re resurrected, because he ascended to sit at the right hand of God, he is our savior, our hope for life eternal. He is our king. He is our Lord. And then Jesus says over and over again in the Gospels, the kingdom of God is not far from us. Indeed, it is at hand. It is over us and in us. Are we ready? Have we made Jesus the Lord, the King of our lives? Are you ready to work in the mission field? Are you ready to go out and make disciples of Jesus Christ for the transformation of the world? And we come back to the question I've been asking. Who do you say Jesus is? Blessed be the name of Jesus, who is our friend, our comforter, our shepherd, our Lord, and our King, now and forevermore. Amen and amen.